Perhaps you feel like at one point in your life, you were convinced that you were going to be used, you were going to do something great, and now it has been a while, and you sit there and you wonder, had I mistaken that all along? We have a call awaiting us from the Lord. We all know what call waiting is, right? Where we are currently occupied or in the middle of a discussion with someone else on our phone, and then another person has the audacity to phone us. In order to answer and respond to that call waiting that's coming in, what we have to do is we need to revert our attention. We need to pause from the person that we're talking to, from the conversation that we're in, from maybe the thing that's distracting us in that moment, that conversation, and turn to pay attention, be attentive, and listen to that call that is coming in. Now, it may not show up the same way it does on your cell phone. It may not be a beeping in your head. If it is, you may want to get that checked out. But sure enough, there is a call waiting for us from the Lord. Finishing up this conversation Moses is having with God here, where he is now listening and hearing in this encounter with the burning bush, this call that has been waiting him. But this call, however, wasn't like we would get our, this was more like FaceTime, all right? This was like one-on-one, Moses, he's in the desert, he's out there, he's doing his shepherd thing, and then God dials him up on AT and tree. God tells Moses that he is supposed to go back to Egypt, go to Pharaoh, approach him, and then lead the people into the promised land. His reservations, his hesitations, and his choosing to almost try and avoid this call actually can make a lot of sense to us if We are honest. He's doing everything that he can, it seems, to avoid being drafted into the Lord's army. I may never march. I'm not going to do the whole thing. Yeah, ride on the cavalry, shoot the artillery. Yeah, except Moses, he's singing, I do not want to listen to the burning tree, confront the enemy, or walk through the Red Sea. And I actually think we can understand. What if God came to you and said, your family is enslaved right now in North Korea, and if you need a reminder, that's not the good Korea. And God comes to you on a regular work day, at, while you're stocking shelves at work, maybe while you're in the home office, maybe while you got your car hearts on or your scrubs. During a normal average work day, God comes to you, you, not to Peter, not to someone from Hillsong, not to some celebrity pastor, not to someone who's graduated from a Bible college or has a doctorate. He comes to you and he says, go to North Korea, go to Kim Jong-un, and tell him, you will let my people go. I got to be honest, I don't know if I would go visit North Korea if God told me to. I can understand his resistance. I could also even understand why he resists, because here's the thing, if God told me to go to North Korea, I would enter into that area with a level of ignorance. I've never been there I know nothing about what it's like, what the living conditions are like, or really what to expect. Not the case for Moses. He knew exactly, and probably with haunting detail and memories, what he would be walking into and who he would be walking up against. Don't think we should just be so quick to jump on Moses and give him a bad rap for this hesitation. Because he is going to go and stand before the Israelite leaders and essentially by him coming and saying God sent me, he is making the proclamation that he is being raised up to be a leader that they need. That leader is being provided. But here's the truth. He had trouble believing that because back in Exodus chapter 2, he'd already been shot down from this position once before. You see, back in Exodus chapter 2, after Moses uh, kills the Egyptian, the very next day he sees two of his Israelite family members, you could call them, fighting. And he goes to them and he encourages them. He says, why are you doing this? To which one of them turns to him and says, who has made you ruler and judge over us? This is back at the time when he felt and believed he was going to be used by God for his people. And now he's 
is being rejected from that position. He has been turned down from this before. In having to respond to this call from God, he's thinking to himself, but, but I've went down this road before. How many times have we done that when we have felt those calls, those nudges, those leadings from the Lord? But God, I tried to talk to them about you once before. It didn't go well. But God, I've applied for a job like that before and I didn't get it. But God, I I tried to do this thing and I was rejected and it didn't work. Sometimes when God has a call that he's waiting to give us, that call waiting can be a call to something we thought we had tried before. Sometimes God's call that he has for us is out of the bondage of living life consumed by an identity that we've taken on ourselves because of things that have happened in the past, then it's an identity that God does not want us to carry any longer. Some lies that we live and we function in. You're not going to be a good parent because of this. You won't succeed because you always do this. You aren't worthy because you did this, this, and that, remember? You aren't smart enough. You aren't bold enough. God can't use someone like you because, and God's call to us is that we don't have to cling to those things. When God calls us into something new, when he wants to put something new or renewed or refresh into our hands, it usually requires us to let go of what is currently in our hands in that moment in order to pick up the new thing that he has for us. We need to lay something down. See, when Moses held on to that piece of wood, that stick, it was a shepherd's staff. And he was simply a shepherd. But when he handed it over and laid it down, something changed. He discovered a power in that simple thing that he was holding on to that he did not have the ability to access when he wasn't laying it down and surrendering it to the Lord. What do you have in your life? What do you have in your hand? I'm sure when God said, what is that in your hand? Moses, the Bible could have said something as simple as, well, I, a rod, I just, just a rod. This is it. This is all I have. And that is fine. See, God's happy with that. God isn't, wasn't devastated with the fact that that was all that Moses had with him. When God first asked Moses what's in his hand, Moses responded by saying, it is simply a rod. But get this, after he lays it down, after he gives it to God, and after he is able to discover the full potential of what that rod could actually do when he trusted it with God, he would no longer refer to it just as a a rod or a staff. It would actually become known as the staff of God. The very title and function of that one thing was going to change. You know what God wants more than to just change the things around you? He wants to change inside of you. He wants to reach inside into our hearts. He does not want to call us simply for an external change. He doesn't want to reveal his power to us for the sake of power. He wants to transform our hearts. I don't know if you've ever seen someone who has walked into a position of tremendous power but haven't had their hearts changed tremendously. Time and time again, as sad as it is, we've seen this in ministries where people have gotten so focused on what they can do with we'll call the rod that they have forgotten to pay attention to what's inside the cloak of their hearts. This is what he wanted to reveal to Moses. This is what he wants to reveal to us. His call isn't just for us to achieve something, to do something, to walk into something, but that he can transform our hearts in the process. Do we ever feel hesitant to step out in faith towards something we're being called to? Do you feel underqualified? 
underprepared, undergifted. If God is calling us to do something, we already have exactly what we need in order to do it. Not because we're so great and powerful, but because he's with us. At no point is God there trying to just like lift Moses up in and of himself, right? It's not like Moses is like, but God, like I don't speak very good. And the Lord's like, oh, Mo, that ain't true. You so handsome. You so eloquent. You got this. It's like, no, it, none of those things even matter. Even if he could speak eloquently, even if he was Shakespearean with his tongue, his confidence needs to be in the fact that God is with him and God is for him. See, because the reality of it is, is this, God is the co-signer, and that's probably an understatement, on our missions and our calls in life. If I cannot get a mortgage, if I do not have adequate access to finances in order to purchase a home, they will give me that home based off of the qualifications, quality, and character of my co-signer. That is who gives me the opportunity, the authority, and the open door to walk into that home and possess that thing. God is the co-signer on our lives. Where we fall short, he fills those gaps. And I know what some of you might be thinking. It's the same thing I've thought countless times anytime I hear these stories in the Bible. Yeah, it's great, but I'm not Moses. It's great, but I'm not David. I'm not Joshua. I'm not Peter or Paul. And we do this sometimes because we get so caught up in focusing on the people God used, but we need to remember who it is that's using them, who it is who made them that way in the first place. And the main, the common denominator in every single one of these situations promises and declares that he is going to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. I need to read this story and stop thinking, God, wouldn't that be nice? And start remembering he can do it again. He can do it again because I'm not Moses. There is a call waiting. Some of you may know exactly what it is. Some of you have may already been taking steps towards it, and some of you might be fighting against it. Some of you might not actually have a clue what it is. But there is a call. But I just want to say th this, that there's a big difference between having questions and concerns and hesitations and saying no. God's never scared of our hesitation. He's not scared of our big question. He answers every one of Moses' hesitations with the reality that he'll provide. And it wasn't until Moses flat out says, send someone else, that God's response changes. This was not a lack of faith in himself, but a faith in God. Getting ready to wrap things up, but I want you to follow me as I say this, because it can sound confusing, but I think it really makes sense when we're honest with ourselves. A lack of faith in God can come from a lack of belief in ourselves. You see, Moses at this point in the story is nothing more than a shepherd. They're not even his sheep. They're his father-in-laws. It appears at this moment as if he'd lost everything. He had slipped and forfeited all of the glory that he had as living with the Egyptians. He had no real relationship with his own people, the Israelites. And he had evidently given up on this call. Moses had believed at one point that he was going to be used for this thing, but now at this point in his life, it doesn't seem like he believes it anymore. And why was he here in the first place? Why was Moses in the desert? What got him to Midian in the first place is the fact that he's a murderer. He murdered someone, and that is what has led him here. Now, how long do you think it took him to murder this guy? seconds, maybe minutes. Let's call it 10 by the time he buried the body in the sand. This mistake that took place over 10 minutes has now haunted him for over 40 years. And isn't that just like the enemy? To take a mistake that we've made in a moment and drag it out to identify us and change us and consume us for years and years and years. We all do this, and Moses was probably doing this in this moment. He had that growing inventory, you know what I'm talking about, of all his personal shortcomings. Here's Moses, thinking about his mistakes, his errors, his guilt, 
his own mistaken identity, his underqualifications, and all the ways he'd labeled himself. And he wrote himself off not thinking he could do this. But God never gave up on Moses and he never gives up on us. God didn't see what Moses saw. God saw a man who was chosen, who was beloved, and who was cherished, and who is now being called. See, Moses was distracted by who he thought he was, that he lost sight of whose he was. And some of us have let errors in our lives or in our judgment control our lives. And this is what God wants to call us out of. That we don't have to live another year dictated by our mistakes. It's beautiful because the Bible tells us there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. God wants to call each of us out of whatever and wherever we are. No matter what you think you've done. There's a call waiting for us. I said at the very beginning of this message that God keeps his promises. And I also need to say this, that out of all the promises that God was making, that he wanted to bring the Israelites out of freedom, he wanted to lead them into the promised land, at the heart of every single one of those promises was the fact that he wanted to use the nation of the Israelite people in order to provide the greatest promise he ever made, and that was for a savior, that was for a Messiah, that was for the answer to Satan's sin and death, and he did exactly that. If you were looking for a sign, if you want your burning bush, God did it, the most miraculous sign he ever did by coming to this earth by putting on flesh and bone making himself vulnerable to the the idiocracy of humanity and dying for our sins in the process and if there is ever a call that we should respond to if I'm ever confident that there is a call from God it is that And if you are feeling it this morning, I want to invite you to respond to that call because when Jesus died, he did not stay in the tomb. But God raised him from the grave and in that moment accomplished and fulfilled every promise that he had made. There's one more promise I want to highlight before we pray. And that's the promise that the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. God is inviting you, every single one of us, into a relationship with him. He invites us to lay down our lives. Allow him to reach into our cloaks. Offer him our hearts and see what he can do. So if that's you today, I invite you to join me in this simple prayer as we end the service. Let's just bow our heads and close. If you want to make that choice today as you're watching this morning for the first time, I just invite you to repeat after me. Pray with me that Jesus, I need you. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the grave. Today I lay down my life. I choose to answer this call and I ask you to move through my life and transform my heart. Amen.